Hey, let's uh, bring in our first guest. This is a big day for elected officials in West Virginia. All of our guests are uh, elected officials in the House, uh, the Senate, or as a constitutional officer. And our first guest is Senator Ryan Weld from the 1st Senatorial District. And uh, as of yesterday, a a declared candidate for the Office of Attorney General. Senator Weld, good morning. Thanks so much for being with us. Good morning. Thank you for having me on. I mentioned uh, to to, uh, Ryan Weld in the commercial break, he and I share a degree uh, school in common. We both attended Duquesne University. His is a law degree, mine's an undergrad degree, so he outranks me. But it's still, you know, same location. Great school, great part of the city up there. I think the law school is called the, isn't that called the Arthur Rooney School of Law still or something like that? It's, it's the Thomas R. Klein School of Law. Thomas R. Klein. Well, I thought there was a Rooney involved in that side. That was close. You've got uh, Steelers on the brain, as always. <laughs> well, there was a Rooney affiliation with that at some point. I'm, I'm not, sure there's yeah. a building on campus named after a Rooney somewhere there. <laughs> yeah. uh, Ryan, yesterday you declared yourself a candidate for attorney general for the state of West Virginia as Patrick Morrissey as a candidate for governor, and he'll be following you on the show, by the way, this morning. I will be vacating that office. Tell us why you have decided to run for attorney general. So I, as a lawyer, I can't think of – as a lawyer and as a West Virginian, I can't think of any greater honor than being able to represent – the state that has given me so much uh, throughout the course of my life to be able to fight and defend this state uh, in our courts, uh, to be able to to work on behalf of the people of the state in that position. You know, the the attorney general's office really does, the people know it for for being in the court system and fighting and defending West Virginia laws and acting on its behalf against federal regulations but the state, the office does so much more than that. And so to have that opportunity, I think, really is something that, that I just can't even put into words what it would mean to be able to do that. You know, over the past couple of years as a legislator, really had the opportunity to travel around the state a lot and get to meet people from all corners of it and, and find out what their concerns are, talk to them, what their worries are for the future, and really started to, to develop a, a a drive to help more than, than the people who live in, in just my Senate district and be able to help on a much larger scale. And and that is, that's the reason that I got into this race. You've got a pretty impressive resume. We talked about it a bit with your military experience the last time that you were on, but for the benefit of those who are meeting you for the first time today as a guest on our program, could you once again share that resume? Sure. So in 2005, uh, well, first, I, I graduated from Fairmont State in 2003. Uh, and then in 2005, I commissioned into the Air Force Reserve. And then I spent pretty much the, the next six years, that entire time, on active duty. Uh, I was an intel officer, and I was always assigned to one of the agencies in the, the intel community in D.C. And then I also did a, a, a tour in Germany, a uh, set of active duty orders there, working for the 3rd Air Force. But then I, I rounded out, uh, finished off my, my active duty time um, in Afghanistan. I was the staff intelligence officer to a, a small joint Army Air Force team in the Zabul province, which is in the southeastern part of that country. We were right on the border with Pakistan. And uh, I, when I finished up my deployment in 2011, that's when I knew uh, that it was time for me to come back home. And, and that's when I moved back to Wellsburg. And, and as you said, I, I went to law school at Duquesne. I went to the night program there. And my first job when I graduated from law school, I was an assistant prosecuting attorney in Brook County for several years. And that's when I first ran for the House of Delegates. And then in 2016, ran for the Senate. In 2020, fortunate enough to be reelected to the Senate. And that's where I serve as as the majority whip. I'm the chair of the military committee. But uh, I'm also the vice chair of judiciary, uh, where I, you know, it's a committee that I'm very proud to serve on with uh, with our chairman, who is one of the senators from the Eastern Panhandle, and that's Charlie Trump from Morgan County. It's a pretty impressive resume, I'd say. Let's uh, go uh, to Matt, uh, co-host Matt Miller here. This morning. The Senator Well, thank you for uh, joining us and, uh, and sharing that. Talk to us about your role as an assistant prosecuting attorney and how that may play into, you know, giving you experience and, and help in this position as an attorney general. So, that's where I really learned about the full depth of 
the drug crisis that we have here in West Virginia. You know, not all the charges that I had, all the cases I had were, were direct narcotics uh, offenses, but they, they stemmed from drugs. It was a robbery. It was a theft. It was an assault, uh, burglary because of drugs. I mean, I would say over three-fourths of the cases, you could always, you know, they were indirectly or directly linked to drugs. And so that really kind of gave me my first true look into the absolute depth of the problem, the handling abuse and neglect cases uh, with DHHR and just the absolute devastation the drugs have brought to families across the state. And so if you look at the Office of the Attorney General, what Patrick Morrissey has, has started there and the, the tremendous work he's done on behalf of the state getting these settlements against opioid manufacturers that just for years just pushed an untold amount of pills into this state. And, and so He's done a tremendous job of, of getting those settlements done, getting the, the court order uh, done in that case that we established the foundation legislatively as a part of that. But not all of those cases are settled. And the next attorney general of the state is going to have to play into that and going to have to play a role in getting those done on behalf of the state. And I think that my experience as a legislator will help tremendously because I've, I think that I've gotten a lot done when it comes to, to substance abuse and drugs in the past couple of years as a member of the Senate because my background as a prosecutor lent me to, to getting involved in that issue and trying to do all that I can because, you know, it's not just a financial uh, you know, damage that it's done to the state. It's damage that it's done to our families, to our criminal justice system, to our workforce. And so the next attorney general is going to have to continue to work in that field, settle more of these cases, hold more of these manufacturers accountable, and, and I think I'm prepared to do that. Also, the need to, to be able to use and, and uh, kind of facilitate the funding that will be coming in from those lawsuits and those settlements and so forth. And uh, uh, Patrick Morrissey has begun to put those things in place. Uh, the, the new attorney general will have to continue that process. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on how that should be used and, and uh, what will help this state to continue to move forward and, and not have this issue? So one of the things that we did this past session, and I'm, and I'm sure that, that Patrick Morris is going to talk about it as well, is we created the foundation that is a part of this the structured settlement agreement that uh, came about in one of the settlements. And that's where a lot of the money that we have received as a state is going to go towards. And the foundation will make decisions based on some very strict guidelines that are set forth in that uh, agreement. Uh, criteria that's set forth in that and how we're going to use that those dollars effectively for uh, substance abuse treatment for law enforcement purposes uh, creating you know an opportunity for West Virginians who have been caught up in this process how, how are we going to use those funds the most effectively and that's what the foundation will help set in motion and so the next attorney general will be involved with that foundation and will have a hand in, in helping it and guiding it as it moves through that process and I was one of the co-sponsors of that uh, bill this past session, worked on it a lot with our current attorney general, with Senator Trump, as I said, from Morgan County, and, and really trying to, to make sure that that got done because that was a big part of that settlement. Are there other major issues that you see right now kind of coming at West Virginia, in particular, you know, some of the uh, more liberal ideas that are out there in our culture and, and are making its way sometimes into law that, you know, as a conservative state like West Virginia, we say we don't want to go certain directions? So it's <laughs> when you ask that question, I, I immediately think of the, the quote from former Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld. He said there are the, the known knowns, the known unknowns, and the unknown unknowns. And, and I say that because it, there are things that are going to come out of D.C. that we can't even think about right now. They're going to try to put, a, you know, a hurt on the state of West Virginia through the industries that employ a significant amount of our population. Uh, you, you look at uh, the, the ruling that Patrick Morrissey was able to get in the EPA case. I mean, that... It was a tremendous win for the state of West Virginia, but we're just going to con see continued regulation of a lot of our industries. You're going to see continued regulation on, I mean, it, things down to the way that we can reduce taxes on our uh, citizens. And what was done in one of the uh, the COVID relief bills that 
you know, during the, a set number of years, states couldn't reduce their taxes. I mean, how how is that? I mean, that's not helping. D.C. is not helping. And so the Office of the Attorney General, you know, we talked about this a little earlier, the biggest thing that people see the, the AG's office out in front of is not just defending the laws of the state when they're when the state is sued because a group may feel that a law is unconstitutional, but fighting against D.C.'s overreach. And so we've seen a lot of examples in the past, and I'm sure there are going to be a lot more in the future that we can't even contemplate right now. I mean, we saw the, the regulations on gasoline-powered vehicles that are coming out uh, soon from the Biden administration. And, and what you're seeing is just a lot of bureaucrats who have never been to West Virginia that are trying to dictate this state's future, but West Virginia should be allowed to dictate its own future because if you've seen – you know, we've had a lot of wins economic development-wise over the past couple of months, you know, year or so, and we're building a new future. And we don't need D.C. to get in the way of that. John Bondwell. Well, it seems to me that, that you feel like there's a lot of federal overreach, as we all do as West Virginians. Um, how how do you want to combat that? How How do you see the West Virginia Attorney General's Office sort of going after that in going forward? So I think that, that the biggest thing is the, the you pick and choose your battles. And, and so I think that, that our current attorney general has done a good job of, of picking the, the fights that West Virginia can lead on and then being a part of you know, when states have, have led on other suits, you know, getting involved in those. But it's really about picking the suits that affect West Virginia the most. And so if you're looking at regulations, are they affecting, you know, industries that this state really relies upon for uh, you know, to employ a lot of its citizens that we you know count on as a, as a big part of our economy, and so those are the kind of things that you would want to look at. I think that also that as you build a coalition with other states, because you know we're probably going to have a lot of new attorneys general in the year 2025, working with with new attorneys general, yeah, ones that are already in office. If you're looking at cases that affect something like you know people's rights under the Second Amendment, and as West because those are the things that I think that, that matter to West Virginians. And so being selective, uh, because, you know, if, if you're spread too thin, maybe you're not, and I've learned this as a lawyer, you're not representing your clients as effectively as possible. And so I think that being smart about that, continuing on as we have, I think that really gives you the best opportunity to, to pick and choose your battles and be the most effective attorney general you can be. Senator Ryan Weld is our guest here on the program. Senator Weld, I want to go to some of the legislation you've been involved in sponsoring. Maybe you can tell us what the status of these bills uh, would be. I, I would guess at this point there, since the, the time has expired for the governor to sign these or allow them to become law, that they just maybe carry over to the next term. But SJR3, you're the lead sponsor of the Constitutional Officer Term Limit Amendment. Now, so I, I have to I, – I don't think that one – if I remember correctly, I don't think that left the Senate. I don't think that the Senate decided to take that one up this year. Mm-hmm. In a previous year, we, we had done that and got that out of the Senate and shifted over to the House, and they did not take it up, if I remember correctly. Uh, so we didn't get that one across the, the finish line that year. And uh, do you see that one coming back again next term? Uh, personally, I, I mean, I'll be reintroducing it. I think I've done so a couple of years in a row, uh, and, you know, continue to work with my colleagues to, to see, you know, in the hopes that they will be able to, to take that up. As you know, I'm sure that right now in the state of West Virginia, we only have two offices that are term limited, uh, and that is uh, governor and sheriff. And so, uh, that one would create some term limits for our statewide officers. Okay, uh, and let's, uh, if we could, uh, talk a little bit about PEIA, because that has become law, and uh, those changes will take effect, I presume, July 1? That, if I remember correctly, you, you are correct, because that's the new plan year, yes. Yeah, right, okay. Uh, were you happy with the way that was negotiated between the House and the Senate and ultimately became law, or would you have liked to have seen a few other things happen with that? I think that we got the, the best deal that we could uh, between the two houses and for those West Virginians, I mean, we're talking about, I think it's between maybe 215, 280,000 West Virginians that are covered by PEIA. Um, you know, well, for, for years and almost a decade at this point, 
those who are responsible for managing PI just refuse to make any difficult decisions whatsoever. And so what happened is you got into a situation, and you and I talked about this before, the Wheeling Hospital just said, we're not going to be able to take PIA anymore because it's paying at 60% below Medicare. And Medicare at 100% is cost. And so they were paying 60% below cost. And, and so because of the mismanagement over the past several years, we finally as a legislature had to step up and step in and make some tough decisions, but also make those decisions cognizant of the fact that, you know, we've got a quarter million people in the state looking to what the, the state government to be able to, to take care of their, to manage their health care. And so we had to do that knowing that we, we had to avoid that. We couldn't just say, well, you haven't had you know, any increases in your premiums for six, seven, eight years, whatever it's been. And we're going to put those all in at once. And we had to structure that in a way that, that allowed for them to uh, you know, continue to receive coverage, but ensure it, we weren't increasing premiums at such a rate that it wouldn't be covered by the pay raises that they received uh, the the tax uh, you know the, the dramatic tra- tax reductions we signed got signed in a law this past session and so I think that we're allowing for that to happen you know it, gradually while they're still going to be able to maintain their coverage and, and not feel it uh, in the at the wallet because of again the, the pay raises and the tax cuts that were structured throughout the session. Uh, SB 660, establishing aggravated felony offense of reckless driving resulting in death. I had uh, Jefferson County Prosecuting Attorney Matt Harvey in and Berkeley County Prosecuting Attorney Kitty wilkes delegetti in at the same time last week, and we talked about uh, this bill. And, and nobody wants to see a mindful driver who unfortunately hits a patch of ice that results in an accident causing death to another party do a life term. I, I think that that would be unreasonable. However... Uh, as they laid out a course for me, it became clear that this really needs addressed. You could have two people drag racing down a road that's 40, 50 miles an hour, topping speeds of 100 miles an hour. Somebody wipes out and takes out a column of people resulting in, in the death of several innocent bystanders who had nothing to do with this reckless driving. And right now, both of these prosecuting attorneys just tell me that at best, They'll do a year in prison, and most likely six months is when they're going to walk, even though their reckless behavior resulted in the death of innocent people. Yep. Yeah, and, and I'm very frustrated that, that we didn't get that bill done. Uh, we got it out of the Senate, and that is something that, that, that Prosecutor Harvey, that Matt Harvey and I worked on for a long time because we had to overcome some, uh, you know, some drafting constraints given some pre- previous court rulings made here in the state of West Virginia. And so we, we really spent some time on that and we got it out of the Senate. Uh, no problem. Once we were able to nail that language down and the house just for whatever reason, didn't take it up. And I know that all the Eastern panhandle delegates were working on that and wanted to see it get done, but it just for some reason wasn't taken up. And it's very frustrating because you're absolutely correct that somebody could be drag racing going 115 miles an hour 90 miles an hour on a backcountry road where the speed limit's 45, kills someone, and at most it's a misdemeanor. You're going to do, you can be sentenced up to 12 months, but with good time credit, you're out in six months. And, I mean, think about that. Is that really justice? Is that really serving justice to someone whose reckless behavior is responsible for the death of someone? I mean, how can you tell a family who lost a loved one, well, I'm sorry, the best they could, but unfortunately, they're going to be out in maybe six months. And that's just, that's not just, right. that, that's not fair to the family. And so, I'm very disappointed that didn't get done, but that's one I'll definitely be bringing back next session. In a state where most of the roads are two lane country roads, it defies belief that people wouldn't be more in tune with the consequences of uh, these roads and the actions of drag racing on them, which does happen. John Bodwell. Senator, going back to PEIA, um, Rob was saying 60% below. Where, with the new legislation, where has that put us with PEIA as, as, as opposed to Medicare um, on the pay rates? That puts us it, it's, uh, at, a, at 110%, so it's 10% above cost. I really I find it surprising. Um, and I, I mean, I'd seen the numbers before, but I never thought about it. 250 to 280,000 people. 
I mean, we're looking at like one out of every seven and a half West Virginians are covered under PEIA. Is that is that normal? Are other states this heavily, you know, public sector for for their employees? So, I, I, I can't speak about other states, and I, I apologize. I don't have any of those numbers, but it's not. It, it wouldn't be just the employee. It's also you know the employee's uh, you know spouse or their children. So it's it. We're not just talking about, and, and then we also have retirees as well. Uh, and so it's not just we're not just talking about like two hundred fifty thousand you know government workers. Then it because we then have to include their, their family members as well if they have them on the, the, that plan. It still just seems like a lot. One one out of every seven and a half West Virginians, roughly, are are covered by PEI. It's so good that you guys got that legislation done, because I mean, not only you know hospitals not seeing people like up in Wheeling, but this would affect our our healthcare system if if that big a percentage of West Virginians can't be seen or are seen at a loss by by doctors and hospitals. We're just going to end up losing more doctors and more hospitals. Oh, it would have been the the reverberations because Wheeling Hospital was just the first domino. I mean, it was going to continue to fall. We were going to see hospital after hospital go that route, provider after provider. So it was – we absolutely had to get that done this past session. And that was part of a uh, – we'll call it a three-legged stool that the PI agreement was also done, uh, you know, concurrently with the, the pay raise bill with the – the tax cuts that we did because, again, it was all a structured fiscal deal that, that we had to work with on, uh, with the House on and the governor's office. Matt Miller. Senator Weld, how does life change since making an announcement that you are going to run for a statewide office, which is so different than running for, you know, say that that state Senate seat within a particular district? Uh, your district now becomes 55 counties. That's got to be a challenge. Well, first and foremost, it means a lot of windshield time. I'm talking to you guys from the the parking lot of a gas station off of I-79 this morning. I'm headed to to Morgantown today. Uh, Got some some more meetings down there. Going to speak with some students at at WVU and the School of Journalism. Uh, And so that's really what it means. It's a lot of windshield time. I got got new tires last week, and I'm ready to to traverse the state to, to get out and meet as many people as possible because I want to, A, introduce myself to everybody and, and let them get to know who I am, and, and B, I, you know, I, more importantly, actually, I want to get to know them. I want to hear what they're concerned about in West Virginia because mm-hmm. the northern part of the state, the northern panhandle, isn't, you know, has different concerns than the eastern panhandle or the southern part of the state or north central West Virginia. And so it's extremely important to get out, meet people, hear what their concerns are, what their worries are, where they see the future of the state going. And so that's really the biggest difference. It's just it's a lot of drive time. Senator Ron Weld has been our guest. He has, uh, as of yesterday, declared himself a candidate for attorney general. And, uh, Ryan, I know you got a busy day, so we'll let you get going here. But uh, I know two things for sure is we'll be driving around this state. Uh, one, you're going to meet a lot of great people. And two, you're going to need a front-end alignment when you're done. <laughs> you're correct <laughs> on both accounts. Thank you, gentlemen, for having me on this morning. Have a great day, sir.